Kevin Haas. I'm the traffic standards engineer. I work out of Salem, but I travel the state. I've been Medford, Astoria, Ontario, Baker City, Stanfield. I'm going to give you a brief history lesson of where roundabouts have been in Oregon. Uh, I do want to address kind of the myths versus reality, and these are the things that probably ring your phone off the hook and people complaining about, you know, put a signal out there, it will fix all the problems, or how many people have to die at this intersection before you do something. We've heard all those questions before. And I do want to talk about the progress we've made in public outreach. And I know when we get into a meeting this evening, we're going to be dealing with agricultural and freight stakeholders. And I want to talk a little bit about how we've engaged those concerns and how if things move forward on Cairo Junction, we'll engage them there as well. So. 1999, right before the, the 2000, was when the first roundabout went in in the state of Oregon. And believe it or not, ODOT was behind that project. It was at Century Drive and Colorado Avenue in Bend. And you see an aerial of that intersection right now. Everybody knows anybody's been to Bend. Bend's got dozens of roundabouts now. But the first one in the state was built by ODOT back in 1999. Now, this has since been jurisdictionally transferred to the city of Bend. Uh, it's no longer, Colorado Avenue is no longer a state highway anymore, or Century Drive isn't. And so that's been, that's where it all started. It started 20 years ago, back in 1999. And then in 2002, we put in our second roundabout in Astoria. Has anybody driven through the one? I know it's a long ways from here. Anybody driven through that roundabout in Astoria? Yeah. So it's right there at uh, Smith Point, or right where the Highway 202 and 101 come together. It's a multi-lane roundabout, still functioning very well to this day. Um, and uh, the community loves it up there. So we installed those two roundabouts in 99 and 2002, and then we started running in to a few hiccups at the agency. Right about after that roundabout opened up in Astoria in 2002, we started hearing some complaints from the freight community. The Astoria roundabout was the first multi-lane roundabout that was built in the state of Oregon. And you can imagine when a commercial vehicle driver driving a WB64 or some other big interstate type truck through that roundabout. In fact, if I go back and look at here, you can imagine some truck going through here. This is the picture of the Astoria roundabout. Going through here and then having, maybe being in the outside lane and then having a passenger vehicle trying to overtake them inside the circulatory roadway. That's a problem. You end up with a car in the blind spot of the truck, you end up with a sideswipe crash. Uh, commercial carriers were starting to complain because they, law enforcement was not citing for any infractions. We didn't have any uh, statutes in the Oregon Vehicle Code dealing with multi-lane roundabouts. So we worked with our legislators to get some updates to the Oregon Vehicle Code, but we still had a lot of outreach to do with the freight industry. And during all this time where we were working through some of these freight industry issues, Roundabouts were exploding across the U.S., not because they were the latest fad, but because of the operational and the safety benefits of roundabouts. And so the Federal Highway Administration started enticing states to do more about roundabouts with federal safety dollars and put a big campaign on there. And then we entered into a very kind of what I call the dark ages at ODOT because of the difficulties we had with the freight industry, there was a moratorium put on roundabouts on the state highway system back around the year 2011. It was almost an 18 month moratorium. Uh, we were kind of, and I'm just gonna peel back the, the layers of the onion, is we did not really have a good relationship with the freight industry over roundabout development. And it took us uh, working with them and developing a, a technical bulletin in the year 2012 to lift that moratorium and it lays out some specific processes on how we will engage the freight industry when we're going to be proposing roundabouts. And so as Cairo Junction moves forward or any other roundabout around the state, we have a directive on how we engage the freight industry. We're gonna engage them over the oversized over-dimensional loads that are gonna go through that intersection. We're gonna engage them on ag agricultural loads and we're gonna make sure we model and make sure any load that needs to get through that intersection gets through that intersection. And yes, I know at Cairo Junction that includes even things like wind turbines, some extremely large loads, and, but we can do that. And we've, pr we've built other roundabouts around the state that are, able of do, are capable of doing that. Then in 2014 to 2016, a very tragic event, I'm gonna highlight that in a few slides here, happened in the Portland metro area. There was a tragic double fatal crash in the area outside of Forest Grove. We had not built a roundabout since the year 2002. 
and that was the first roundabout that got installed on the state highway system. It opened up in 2016, but the fatal crash that took place in 2014 kind of jump-started the process to get roundabouts moving again on the state highway system. And then in 2017, we opened up Sisters, and then just last year, we opened up Prineville. Anybody gone through the Prineville roundabout up in Tom McCall? Yep. And so, um, we have now five roundabouts on the state highway system and we've got many more on the drawing board. So I wanted to give you a snapshot, a little bit about where roundabouts are around uh, the Pacific Northwest. And so uh, you see a little bit of a hole here in Eastern Oregon, but we have several right here and obviously Central Oregon, in fact, it's not just seven, that seven's on top of like a number of 30. I think there's probably 40 roundabouts in the Bend area, a lot on city and county. Uh, roads in that area, plus a couple state highway ones. Uh, a lot in Eugene, Springfield area, a few in the Valley and Salem and uh, Albany area, and then a lot more up in the Portland metro area that have been installed by Clackamas County, Washington County, Forest Grove. And Washington State has far exceeded us in roundabouts. They've got over 200 across the state, many of them on the state highway system. And then even uh, IDT has, has installed in some of the counties in, in Idaho, have installed in, in Montana and other areas. Focusing a little bit more, uh, Northwest Oregon, there's, there's the, uh, it's not out in the middle of uh, the Columbia River, it's just where the, the circle went. There's the Astoria roundabout. You can see several around the Portland metro area in Southwest Washington, uh, up in the Kalama area, up all the way up to Kelso. Um, even though we don't have any in, in Eastern Oregon, they are familiar to people around this area. I'm sure people have all, all been up to Tri-Cities, Walla Walla area. Several, Washdot has built several roundabouts. You will find them up in the Tri-Cities and Walla Walla area, many of them at State Highway intersections, many of them at ramp terminals with freeway systems around the Tri-Cities area. And then they're also, they're, they're not foreign to the Treasure Valley. Yes, we have none here on the Oregon side of the border. But go over, you'll find them in Caldwell, you'll find them in Nampa, you'll find them in Boise. Um, in fact, Franklin Road and Star Road, I just pulled this picture off and I, I actually went out to Nampa this morning. I just snapped these pictures this morning. Anybody been through this roundabout at all in Nampa? I mean, that's like, what, 20 minutes from here? 25 minutes on the, on the freeway? And so I snapped this picture this morning. Um, you can see it's a, it, a lot of trucks go through this intersection. And in fact, while I was out there, yeah, this was, I mean, this is like maybe five hours ago that I shot this video, or four hours ago. Look what went through there. Oversized load, and he, he barely went up on that truck apron. And look how forgiving that truck apron is. So it, it had absolutely no problem whatsoever going through that intersection. And that was just shot this morning. And so I mentioned about the state highway roundabouts in Oregon. So what we've got is, I mentioned Prineville opened up last year, Sisters opened up in 2017, and then we have the one up in Astoria that was clear back in 2002. That's been open for 17 years. And then there's a couple of dots right on top of one another there in Forest Grove. There's two right outside of Forest Grove that are on Highway 47. Uh, and Verbort Road and, and David Hill Road. And then you see some of the ones that are already on the drawing board. We're working on one at US 20 in Tumalo, uh, right outside of Bend right now. We're working on another one in Region 2 at Highway 99W and Clow Corner, north of Monmouth. And you'll see some signalized intersections I highlighted for some comparison of why we chose a roundabout. There's one that's going to construction, I believe, this next summer at Highway 140 and Foothill, an extension down in the Rogue Valley area. Another one that's on Highway 140 in the Klamath Falls area at Homedale. And so we, we've got several on the drawing boards that are gonna be going to construction the next three to four years in the area. But I do wanna talk about how that moratorium period went in 2011, 2012 period before we got the moratorium lifted. And what really got us moving again on roundabouts in, in Oregon and getting through some of the impetus with the freight industry was a tragic event that took place in Forest Grove back in 2014. And so here's a news clip from uh, Channel 12, the Fox affiliate in Portland on April 7, 2014. Two teenagers died after their car collided with a truck on Highway 47 this morning. Fox 12 Gloria has talked to a man who tried to help the driver. She's live in Forest Grove with the details, Laura. 
in front of that crash happened near Northwest for Borch Road and Highway 47 this morning. The road was shut down for quite some time for this investigation, but it's been reopened. This is about a mile north from Forest Grove. That crash happened around 9.25 this morning. Oregon State Police say a Hyundai was stopped on Northwest for Borch Road and then pulled into the path of a box truck that was heading north on Highway 47. Police say the truck driver had little time to react and crashed into the Hyundai. The two people inside the car, an 18-year-old girl and a 19-year-old girl, died at the scene. Both victims are from Northwest Portland. We spoke with the driver who witnessed the crash. He got out of his car and tried to help the driver in the Hyundai. He said the driver was unconscious and at first he didn't even realize there was a second person in the car. It's just a tragedy what happened here today. But I wish I could do more. And, and my heart goes out to the families that were affected, both the families that, of these people that died and the driver too and his family. That and that truck driver is 44-year-old Corey Jordan from Gaston. He wasn't injured. Police say he is cooperating with their investigation. They have not released the names of the teenagers who were killed in this crash. Police do say that everybody was wearing their seatbelts. For 40 Live near Forest Grove, I'm Laura Rios, the 5 o'clock news. All right, so let's see if you had some observations while they were showing footage of the scene. What can you tell me about the weather conditions on that day? Pretty clear. 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 No moisture on the roadway. How about sight distance out at that intersection? Unrestricted. Unrestricted. Yeah. Complete unrestricted sight distance in all directions. Why do you think they pulled out in front of that box truck? Nobody will know. Nobody will know. It's sad, but nobody will know. And uh, it wasn't just the Fox affiliate. This was the lead story on every news channel and every newspaper. And so what they didn't know until the following day when this ran in the Oregonian or, or a little bit later was that the two teens killed were for, uh, Pacific University students and Pacific Universities in Forest Grove. You can see the weather conditions that day. I mean, it makes you sick to your stomach to look at that vehicle. I mean, they just didn't have a chance. And nobody will know why they pulled out in front of that box truck. The, the box truck driver was not, it, he tested clean. Um, he said they just pulled out right in front of him and, and he had, couldn't do anything to avoid them. Look, Kevin, the, yeah. those things you just said in, a, uh, in observations are very similar to Cairo Junction. Mm -hmm. um, and even our last fatal that we had at that intersection, very similar to that. The right. Were that the car stopped. Right. And they just pulled right, they mm -hmm. pulled right out in front of a semi. Mm -hmm. they, almost the exact same thing. Right. Um, so so par part of what makes this sad is I know this location. I've worked for the, for the agency for ODOT for going on 22 years now. And I remember back in the early 2000s when we did a safety project out at this intersection and we widened it way out, we put in left turn lanes, we put in right turn lanes, we made this grandiose intersection to hopefully make it safer. And yet, still fatal crashes were happening out at this, this intersection. And so here we are again. And it's like, it's the age old question, how many people have to be killed at this intersection before something's done? But there's even illumination for night. Mm -hmm. Yep, there was an illumination out there before and that was another thing we did in the safety project back in the early 2000s. I think it was like around 2007 that we did a safety project. Uh, it happened to be in region one, the Portland metro area region that covers this area and they did a safety project at that time and they added illumination and widened out the intersection. And so here we are again in 2014, it's generating a lot of interest. Fortunately, in addition to that safety uh, project, when we had still were having safety problems out there, in between when this crash happened and the, that safety project in 2007, we knew we were still having safety issues out there, and so we did what was called a road safety audit. And the department, it's a very small amount of money. You can do them for like $30,000, $40,000. You bring in a consulting team. You go out and get people that are unfamiliar with the area to kind of do a a fresh eyes look at the intersection because a lot of times uh, you would you'd be amazed a lot of times the best way to get an objective look at your intersection is to invite some people from outside of the Treasure Valley here to go look at a place like Cairo Junction or for you guys to go travel to the Portland area or to the valley and do a safety audit over there because you don't drive those roads every day and you're going to notice things that people just drive by every single day and that's what we had done a road safety audit out there and they said 
you know what, this is a perfect candidate for a roundabout intersection. And we had a road safety audit report that said we would work towards a roundabout at that intersection. And so when this fatal crash, we didn't have any funding for it, it hadn't been programmed into the STIP, it wasn't high on the priority list, but you know when something runs in the news, on, and starts running in the news cycle day after day, all of a sudden priorities get shifted. And that's what happened as this started getting some publicity. The headlines kept going and we got legislative leaders on board and you can see the very next day uh, in the Oregonian, they ran an article that ODOT will push for a roundabout at Oregon 47 and Verbort Road. We had some legislative leaders that were on board with that solution. Uh, we got Senator Bruce Starr who represented that area at the time. Um, got on board with it and was doing public outreach, reaching out to local officials through the city of Forest Grove and Washington County. Uh, Washington County had already built roundabouts further on on Verbort Road, which was their facility. So that helped in the discussion. But even in the midst of all this, you get all the stakeholders behind you. You get the elected leaders behind you. What do you think the public is telling us to do? Signal up. This is what ran in the Oregonian. A petition was circulated with 2,400 signatures. They were ringing the legislator's phone off the hook. Why are you doing this? Just put in a signal. It's going to fix all the problems. And we had to deal with that. And we had to push against that initial resistance through this. And I'll show you why we're able to push through that uh, resistance in a minute. But if I had a dollar for every time somebody tells me just put in a signal and all the safety problems would go away, I wouldn't be standing before you. I'd be retired on some beach somewhere right now because I hear that all the time. And I'm not saying that to put down or belittle the general public or belittle politicians. That's not what I'm trying to say at all. But we hear this, we're comfortable with traffic signals, we think signals are the best that we can do, but the data just shows that is not the case at all. In fact, if you go pull Oregon crash data, and this is readily available to you, you don't need an engineer like me to pull the crash data. We produce an annual summary report every year of all the crash data across the state of Oregon. You can download the reports online. On average, almost half the crashes that happen at traffic signals across the state involve injuries or fatalities. Is that on the highway system or is that all signals? That's all signals. Okay. I don't care if it's a signal system in downtown La Grande or Ontario or Portland or Salem or Medford or Bend. On average, does that mean some are going to be less than 50%? Yeah. But it also means there are going to be other intersections where it's actually higher than 50%. But on average, about half the crashes that take place at a signalized intersection in Oregon are going to involve injuries or fatalities. A majority of those are going to be injuries, but there's going to be several fatalities. In fact, I think we average, on average, about 40 to 50 of the fatalities of the 450 fatality, fatalities that take place in the state of Oregon on our highways each year take place at signalized intersections. And I'll, I'll show you some data on that a little bit later in a slide. And it's easy to kind of just pass by injuries of, oh, somebody got hurt. But yeah. the injuries are oftentimes very serious. Right. People end up paralyzed, broken legs. I mean, their, their lives aren't the same. If, if some of you have some insight on what uh, causes some of this, I, I still, I've been doing this, like I said, for 22 years. And I still, to this day, can't figure out why when something happens at an intersection like this, the news stations, the newspapers run a story and everybody's outraged and then you see the petition circulated to, we can't let this stand anymore. We need to install a signal because that's going to solve the problem. Yet when somebody is killed in an intersection, I have yet to see somebody come to, or ring my phone off the hook and ask me, why do we have a signal at that intersection? Nobody seems outraged when a fatality happens at a signalized intersection. Does anybody know why that is? Sure. They think everything that you can do has been done. Mm -hmm. they, they, don't, they don't see that there's anything else that can be done. But a signalized intersection is still going to be a 90 degree impact. Right. Right. But they think there's nothing else that can be done. Mm -hmm. it's public, it's public so they go, well, you know, they just, somebody just screwed up. There's nothing right. else we can do. And, I, and, and please don't misunderstand me. I am not anti-traffic signal. I have traffic signal engineers on my staff in Salem. I support their work wholeheartedly. But do you know how many traffic signals, just ODOT, I'm just talking ODOT now, just the ones that we maintain. You know how many traffic signals ODOT maintains across the state on the state highway system? 1,500 traffic signals around that. And do you know how many roundabouts we have on the state highway system? I just told you. 
Five. Five. Five roundabouts and 1,500 traffic signals. Well, just, to, just as, as some insight, you know, I traveled this area a lot. And say, take the signal at airport corner, okay? If you're going, if you're going north and you, you've come down that road, there's, there's usually not a problem. People are expecting a signal. But you come up the hill and around the corner, that area is, of course, it's a higher speed, but that whole area coming up to that, uh, that stoplight is just paved in rubber. You can sit there and you can watch trucks get up to that intersection all day long because they're not expecting it. It's a higher speed. It takes them by surprise. They don't have the flashing light like they do on the other side. And so just, just from one side to the other in the, in the intersection in front of the, the John Deere dealer, you don't have the problem because people are kind of expecting it there. I mean, there's still some, but, but not like there is at the other. And that's why we, as our SEAC talked about, the signal just isn't going to work at right. Arrow Junction because it's too remote. You mm -hmm. have so much signage coming up to it, so much light. Right, right. You also run into the fact that those folks, that, and I've been on the road as probably most everybody has several years, decades, but um, yellow, what should yellow light mean to you? Especially on the highway, where you're going to run the yellow light. Mm -hmm. Most of the time you're running yellow light, maybe running into a red light. <coughs> Whereas a roundabout, there are no lights. No. But that, that can come, that mm -hmm. causes accidents as well, because the guy that gets the green light thinks it's a good right. way to go, and if they don't wait, right. they can have an accident. I see people go through the red light, particularly big trucks. Yep, all Not the time. Not even slow down, you know. All the time. Mm -hmm. They just go right through it, they don't, they don't right. expect it, they don't see it. Well, and we're spending we're spending a lot of money at our signalized intersections to improve safety. And there are things we can do at signalized intersections to improve safety. Some of them is improving dilemma zone detection, knowing when trucks are approaching to extend green time. There's technology we can do, but it still will never beat the safety performance of a of a roundabout yeah, intersection. The signals have their place. Mm -hmm. yeah, they do. They do. They, they've got a fantastic place, but there's some places they're not as good. not not on high speed rural road intersections. That's for sure. So. A couple of things that illustrate this, and, and you'll find some locations that you're familiar with here. This is Monmouth, uh, Oregon, to the west of Salem, home of Western Oregon University. I've got an arrow pointing at that intersection there, which is Hoffman Road and 99W. Here's a kind of an aerial 3D view. What can you tell me about that, the, the road use environment there? Fairly high speed. High speed, because it's in a rural environment. It looks like fairly low ADT. Yep, it's under 10,000 on there. Pretty nice intersection. Looks like it's got protected left turn. Right. Yep. So, that, yeah, you, good visibility. It's not skewed or anything like that. And so, as Monmouth was growing, and I'm pointing to that intersection, in the five years from 95 to 99, there were 19 crashes at that intersection, 12 of them involved fatalities or injuries. Most of them were injuries. I think there was one fatality in that five-year period and seven property damage only crashes. So we as an agency were uh, pressured by the local authorities and I, I'm not throwing them under the bus. Uh, City of Monmouth, uh, which I think their urban growth boundary doesn't go quite out there because of some wetlands, but they, they were adamant they wanted to see a signal because of this uh, back door connection to Western Oregon University that's right here. Uh, Polk County out there was uh, wanted to see a signal and they said put in a signal in fact let's use safety dollars for it because it's going to improve safety and you get federal safety dollars so so we did we used federal safety dollars for that we installed a signal in in 2000 and this is what it looks like out there today rural farmland throw up a couple poles out there probably not what you would expect out there anybody want to venture what's happened to the safety statistics since we put in the signal out there. We're up now, the most recent five years of data that we have between 2014 and 2018, and, and traffic volumes haven't grown that much out there. 25 crashes. So we went from, what was it before? I gotta look at the number now. 19 before with 12 higher severity crashes. Now we're at 25 with 18 high severity crashes. And we put this in with safety dollars, saying we'd improve safety out there. And it's gone the opposite direction. And we've done things, this also has trucks going up and down 99W, which is a uh, Western Oregon agricultural corridor. Lots of agriculture between the McMinnville all the way down to Corvallis on 99W. Um, and we put in dilemma zone detection out there and we still are getting 
um, severe crashes out in this area. Here's another intersection. Does that look familiar to anybody? Yeah. West 18th at 201. Yep. Here's Ontario. Here's a close-up of the intersection. Okay, so in the 10 years, I'm expanding it now to 10 years of crash data. 10 years of crashes before the signal was installed. We had seven injury crashes and three property damage only crashes. And I think this was installed, was this installed about when the Ituri belt line was being done around? Just prior. Just prior, just prior to that, in the midst of this. I did go back and verify, it was 2003 when the signal went in, because you can go back and look at the video log and find out when the signal first appeared on. You feel guilty for working on that project? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see what the numbers look like. So 10 years, we put the signal in in 2003. Here's what it looks like out there today. Anybody want to guess what the most recent 10-year crash history is up for that intersection? In the back? I'll guess up. Yes. And how about the severity? Up or down? I know one field. Yep, I'll have that on there. It's gone up to 17 crashes. Anybody remember the fatal crash out there in 2013? Yeah. Eight injury crashes, eight property damage crashes. So. Remember what I said earlier, I said on average, on average across the state, you can take a signalized intersection in Astoria, one in, and I'm not just talking state highway intersections, I'm talking city streets and county roads too. You can take a signalized intersection in Astoria, one in Coos Bay, one in Medford, one in Bend, Prineville, Ontario, Baker City, I don't care. On average, it's about 50% of the crashes that happen at that intersection are gonna be fatal and injury crashes. I'm counting here eight, nine, nine, of 17 is a little bit higher than 50%. And so that intersection is performing worse than average for the entire state of Oregon for crashes. Now, I can go on a soapbox about signals, but we have to overcome some of that skepticism. So I, I mentioned how Senator Starr and Senator Johnson were kind of our partners in helping out because it was their, their area there. In, or it was adjacent to, they had adjoining uh, Senate districts and so they were helping us through that process. And part of that outreach is what you see, look at Verbort Road and Banks, this is what you see out there today, that roundabout that was constructed. So part of it is doing the outreach. It's not just, nobody likes being told what to do. The last thing you need is some guy from Salem to come in and tell you what to do. These need to be local community decisions. I can help you through the process. It's been happening to us for a long time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know, I keep my may, 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 maybe, the, maybe the second thing, most frustrating thing to living over here and seeing what's going on in Salem is having to live in Salem and see what goes on in Salem. And I, I can't pretend to understand it, but part of it's doing the outreach. And that's why I go to places like the Rogue Valley and I come to the Treasure Valley and I go to Stanfield to deal with other issues or Hermiston or Prineville. Or, and I've done a lot of these outreaches. And it's, to, it's not just for me to talk, it's to listen to you as well. But part of that is doing some of these outreach videos like we've done. Reduce the types of crashes where people are seriously hurt or killed by 78 to 82 percent compared to conventional stop controlled and signalized intersections. Because of ODOT's commitment to improving safety on Oregon roadways, we're working with local communities to install more roundabouts at high-risk intersections. When we teamed up with ODOT on Highway 47 at Bearboard, that was one where clearly Highway 47 had a lot of traffic and we had stopped on the side and, and the roundabout worked out very well. We worked with ODOT and we worked with the trucking industry to make sure that that design was good for them. It is a great benefit to the citizens, and safety-wise, they're just so much safer than a signalized intersection on a high-speed road. When we're dealing with the freight industry and all sorts of stakeholders, we don't just come in and throw our design on the table. It's a back-and-forth process. It's an iterative process. That directive that I mentioned, there's a back-and-forth process in dealing with the stakeholders to make sure we get the design right. It's, there's no cookie cutter design for a roundabout. What we did in Forest Grove, close to Omega Morgan, it had to be able to handle those mega-sized, super-sized, over-dimensional loads like has gone in here with the evaporator. Our roundabout had to be able to handle that type of traffic without any special kind of modification, so it's gonna be a little bit bigger. And so 
There is not a roundabout we've constructed, at least from ODOT's perspective on the state highway system, that cannot handle any truck that's been thrown at it. And that's saying a lot. Does that mean sometimes if it's a really big load, like is that evaporator, does that mean you're shutting down the whole in intersection? You bet you are, because you're flagging that, road, that load through at 2, 3 in the morning. And you're going to be shutting down the entire intersection, but there's a way to get it through there. But we shut down entire highways to get those. Exactly. Those are the roads that those loads, those super loads are traveling at odd hours of the time, and you're shutting down the whole highway to get those loads through. And so... What's the percentage of crashes at Cairo? I have a slide at the end and I'll show you the statistics, but... And I'd like to know even on, what is it that goes downtown uh, Ontario? You got lights there too, Southwest 4th and 2 Yeah. Thank you. I, I do know Cairo's got one of the highest crash totals for a 10-year history of anywhere in the region. Um, and it's, it's numbers that you would typically see in the valley and you don't have that much traffic as, as the valley does. And so you get concerned when you see numbers as high as Cairo has. And so we know that there needs to be something done out there. But this is the big thing in bold. We're, I, I, how many, I can't mention how many times that we're not here to push roundabouts because it's the latest and greatest flavor that Federal Highway or ODOT or local jurisdiction is, is putting out there. There is no other tool that we have in the toolbox that virtually eliminates fatal and serious injury crashes. And it, why does it do that? Because we bring speeds down, even in a rural area. And yet we still move as many vehicles through. Are there any studies on those on specifically drug-induced or DUI driving? There, I, as far as directed towards DUI or impaired driver studies, I don't know of any directed to specifically at roundabouts. There's been generalized studies. But there has been studies by the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety on the difference of impaired and distracted drivers driving through roundabouts versus signals. And it's found that distracted and impaired drivers are a much larger problem at signalized intersections than they are roundabout intersections. Because roundabouts require your attention. And so even, a, even, an, even an impaired driver has some visual clues that they need to pay attention with the limited ability that they have to pay attention with at a roundabout intersection as opposed to just being totally spaced out and running the red light through a signalized intersection. And I could pull up that Insur Insurance Institute for Highway Safety study. You say that they're built to slow down traffic, but yet you're putting them in a major highway for freight mobility and you're slowing it down, mm -hmm. which is Trucks are involved in more accidents at stopping and starting, and these virtually make us stop and start. And I obviously, I'm over on this side of the state, but I've been through a lot of them in Washington. And I haven't been through a roundabout yet that if it's a single lane, I'm not on the curb on both sides. Mm -hmm. Two lane, I'm taking both lanes. Mm -hmm. And, in, and in, in Oregon, that would be my recommendation on a multi-lane if it's a two-lane. I, I don't even think Washington State has the statutory support in their Washington Vehicle Code yet. In Oregon, we do. You have a legal right driving a commercial vehicle in a multi-lane roundabout to take both lanes. Right. And, and it if, still draws the car to us and the lot right, to Right. That, I would recommend taking both lanes because then that keeps them from, oh, yeah. from crowding up around, alongside of you. We design them so two WB67s could go side by side through the roundabout, which makes them, them big, but I would still recommend taking both lanes. And uh, it's, there's some differences in, in driving laws per state on what you're allowed or not to do. I think, okay, yeah, I'm biased, Oregon DOT. I think we do a really good job on designing them properly on the state highway roundabouts. Remember I said we only have five of them. Right. We do a good job, a very good job, designing them properly for commercial vehicles in the state. I can't speak for what WashDOT has done. Yeah. It's slowing all the traffic down. Yeah. You ask him, he asked a number on trucks. I had 8,000 loads that went through that intersection last year. Mm -hmm. So that's 16,000 times I went by there. Right. And that's going to, I mean, that's going to cost a lot of time over a year's time. What if I showed you that the roundabout was going to, you were going to get through the roundabout faster than you would if a signal was at that intersection? Well, that could be because there's not a signal there. 
It's like the one you showed there in Idaho. That was a four-way stop sign right. before they made it a right. So that probably sped the traffic up. Right. And how much fuel are you burning, you know, just getting up to the up to the stop stopping and starting? And that's the one thing at a roundabout is you typically have a rolling queue. You don't have to come to a stop if there's no conflicting traffic. So I told you I'd, I'd pull back the curtain and there are some ongoing challenges. And so I'd love to discuss some of those. And some of those are what we're talking about in here. Meeting with the freight industry and agricultural haulers with their concerns about accommodating your loads and delay or anything else. And so those are th some things we continue to work on. And I'm gonna share uh, how we're working on those things. And then communicating the benefits of roundabouts to not only stakeholders, but elected officials. I'm, I'm so glad that, that we have elected officials here uh, tonight. And uh, also to you know the general public who, who's skeptical. And they should be skeptical. None of us like things that are new. We don't like trying things that are new. We like things that are comfortable. We're used to traffic signals. We're used to high-speed highways. We're used to four-way stops. But if there's a safer way of doing something and we can move the same or more freight and eliminate fatal and injury crashes, my ears per perk up. Because let me tell you, the statistics are going in the wrong direction. Have you been watching the fatal numbers? They have not been good. They have not been good. And I know OSP knows this. You, you're, yeah, you see them. Uh, yeah, we're adding more residents to the state of Oregon on a whole from border to border, but the numbers are not, are not good. We have more distracted drivers than ever out on the roadway, and our fatalities do not seem to be coming down. They seem to be flatlining. We, we had some good uh, success in the early 20-teens, but as we get toward close to the end of this decade, the numbers are not trending in the right direction. And so... Prineville is our latest roundabout that was opened up. Have any of you driven through that roundabout in Prineville? Okay, it's up there on top of, by the airport. It's not in Prineville, well it's inside the city limits, but the city is annexed out there to the airport. But this is up on top of the hill where Facebook and Apple have built their new data server farms and, and Prineville's doing tremendous development up there and then Les Schwab has their big distribution center up there. So a lot of freight goes through this intersection. And so here's a video after it opened last year with Joel McCarroll, our district manager over there, narrating a few things. Roundabouts are uh, much safer than other types of intersection traffic control. They have fewer crashes and fewer serious crashes than traffic signals and or always stop controlled intersections. When I'm driving in a roundabout, I feel safe. The speeds are lower. Uh, I'm able to make decisions based on what other people are doing uh, at very low speeds. Um, they're generally very comfortable for bicyclists to merge over and take the lane and, and travel through there. Um, and they eliminate the potential for uh, angle type crashes that you might see at a normal four-legged intersection, whether it's stop controlled or signals, uh, where, where the four physics in those crashes tend to lead to much more severe injuries. The, the, the roundabout at Oregon 126 and Tom McCall opened a couple of weeks ago fully. It had been functioning without side street traffic, but now the side streets are opening, are open. Um, the traffic seems to be flowing well. We've been able to move uh, some over-dimensional loads through the roundabout itself. Uh, Facebook and Apple have generated some over-dimensional trips and we've been able to get them to their sites. Slow down on entry, y look to your left and, and yield to vehicles circulating in the roundabout. There is a boatload of freight traffic that goes through that roundabout intersection. And I didn't see any of them having any trouble getting through that because we designed them properly for freight to get through that intersection. We have had a few issues at Primeville, not with the width of the entries, but there were some vertical curbs that went in on some of the entries that shouldn't have gone in. They have since been retrofitted and been with, we do everything in uh, the roundabouts with low profile mountable curbs. That means the truck apron is a low profile mountable curb. Only it's got a wedge piece, only three inch height difference. The splitter islands, outside truck aprons, all mountable curbs. You can get your tires up onto any of those surfaces, won't get the vertical scrub, it's got a smooth surface to get up there. Any low boy, six inches or what, eight inches off the ground, it's gonna have no problem getting over any of those truck, truck aprons. 
In fact, you saw that from the, the Nampa video I showed at the beginning of the presentation with Idaho's roundabout is that that low boy had no issues whatsoever, even though it just barely got up onto the curb there. So we have another one that's going in down in southwest Oregon in the Medford area and uh, White City. And if you've been following any of the things da happening down in southwest Oregon, that area has seen tremendous growth down in that part of the state. Uh, yes, I think there's a lot of Californians moving into that part of the state as well. Uh, the Medford area's got huge residential and business on the east side of uh, I-5 and Crater Lake Highway, Highway 62. And the, what you can't see real well, this yellow on the, foot, on the edge of the foothills, appropriately called Foothill Road or Foothill Boulevard, is a narrow two-lane farm-to-market road that Jackson County and the city of Medford have struggled to widen over the years. There's only a few portions that are widened, and traffic is kind of a nightmare in that section of the Rogue Valley around the morning and evening rush hours. Jackson County is doing a project to connect up Foothill to Highway 140 and beyond as kind of a bypass route around the eastern part of the city, and we've partnered with Jackson County on this project. Foothill is going to be extended this next summer uh, into an arterial, arterial type roadway in the state highway, Lake of the Woods Highway. We are going to have a partial multi-lane roundabout at this intersection and uh, it will have uh, multi-lane legs on the south leg and on the east leg coming in and the north and west legs will be single lane and that's because the traf traffic volumes and the traffic forecast uh, dictate those types of lane arrangements. And so as part of that, we've also reached out, we not only reach out in stakeholder meetings, we ask the freight industry to bring their trucks to test out our uh, layouts. And this is what happened just a few months ago down in uh, Medford, Boise Cascade offered us their yard to lay out a uh, roundabout configuration on what's being designed there. And you'll see a cameo from yours truly in here. So we're here in North Medford and we're doing a, what we call a roundabout rodeo. It's really an opportunity for the freight industry to come test out their configurations of trucks for what we're doing in building a roundabout at Oregon 140 and Foothill on the north side of Medford. You're going to go straight through the roundabout. On the inside of the circle, there's sandbags. That's a truck apron, so you're allowed to go up onto that if you need to. One of the things that uh, we're involved in and in doing these roundabout rodeos is engaging the freight community in our configurations of roundabouts. So the way we do that is we invite them to bring their configuration trucks. I think we have about eight different trucks coming here today, all of different sizes from a school bus all the way to a 120 foot low boy truck to go through the roundabout configuration and to test our design configuration. Uh, it's plenty fine. It's wide enough. It's got good turns in it. Not real sharp. I think it'll work just right. Okay. Any problem with off tracking at all? No, no. As long as, it, as, long as the, the white bags are the, the curbs that you can run your tires up on and around, you won't have any trouble at all getting through there. Well, the, the way we've laid out the roundabout as designed right now, we not only have the curb lines laid out, we have the lane lines, and we have the truck apron that's in the central island that allows vehicles to off track, the lengthy vehicles. And we found that every vehicle combination that we've run through there, run through the roundabout this morning, has made it through with flying colors. We get a lot of comments that why don't you just put in a signal? But when we make data-driven safety decisions and we look at the, the historical data, on average about half the crashes at all signalized intersections across the state involve injuries or fatalities. And the reason we propose roundabouts is because roundabouts nearly eliminate all fatal and serious injury crashes. We do geometric design changes to lower speeds, even in a rural area, we bring those speeds down so any crashes that do happen are low severity crashes. They really are the only tool we have in the toolbox for at-grade intersections that effectively reduce or eliminate fatal and serious injury crashes. So, you know, part of my job is to just let you know what some of the numbers and some of the outreach numbers tell us and part of that is communicating not just to stakeholders but working along with our elected officials and working along with city councils working along with county commissioners uh, working with the local community on on what a roundabout and the benefits are and it, it is part of a sales job and I'm not trying to sell you 
up the river, I'm trying to sell you something that's going to reduce fatal and serious injury crashes. And part of that is communicating to a public that believes that signals will fix all their problems. And like I said, you can pull this information yourself. You don't need me to interpret the reports for you. ODOT publishes all this information. It's all the DMV crash data that's available for at signalized intersections. And this is what the last full five full years of data show across the state. This is not just state highway intersections. This is all signalized inter intersections across the state. And you can see in 2016, we were over 3,000 total crashes at signalized intersections across the state. And all, nearly 2,000 of those involved fatalities or injuries. That's what the numbers tell you. In what universe do we live in where it's acceptable that we have over 8,000 fatal or injury crashes at signalized intersections over a five-year period? You know, we've done some things. Red light cameras have a lot of controversy around them, big brother controversy. Sometimes they're installed in locations that produce more revenue generation than safety benefits, but they are sometimes put in locations where they have safety benefits too. Um, anytime OSP or local law enforcement can go out and nail a red light runner, that's, that's a safety benefit if we can deter red light running. But still, we see over 8,000 fatal and injury crashes happening over a five-year period on our system. And, and that's what the numbers tell us. I'm not making up the numbers. And so we have to keep you engaged and keep myself engaged on this issue. And this should not come as a surprise because I know many of you walked in here skeptical and I'm willing to take any questions you have. Questions I can't answer, I'll have Paul answer them. <laughs> or have Senator Benz answer them for me, maybe. <laughs> He'll give me his opinion. But anywhere where we're doing something new, and this doesn't matter if you're proposing a roundabout for Cairo Junction or Walla Walla, Washington or Boca Raton, Florida or Columbus, Ohio or wherever it may be. The overwhelming attitude with something new coming into the, with a roundabout, this research, this is national research, is overwhelmingly against it or very negative reactions from the public, from stakeholders, from elected officials. And then when you push through the initial resistance, after it's open, you go back and quiz the same people. What do you think happens to the public opinion? Before I put this up here. Not just greatly, it literally does a 180. And so, you know, I, I, what I can tell, you know, our legislative leaders is if you don't believe me, then go talk, go talk to the city council at, at, uh, at Forest Grove. Go talk to the Washington County Commissioners and find out if they, they wish the roundabout at 47 and Verbort was torn out and a signal was in. I don't think you'll find one that says they should, but go, to, uh, go talk to people. I, part of my other outreach is doing, not just on roundabouts, I do outreach on traffic signals. I would, just came back from doing an outreach up in Stanfield for a potential roadway reconfiguration up there on US 395 between I-84 and uh, Hermiston where they're trying to get, bring speeds down through Stanfield. And they were, the city council was somewhat skeptical and I said, don't listen to me. Go talk to Milton Freewater that just did a roadway reconfiguration through downtown Milton Freewater. Go talk to your neighbors in Umatilla County and find out what they think about it. Don't listen to some guy from Salem. Go talk to somebody else if you're skeptical on what I'm saying. Everywhere where we've done this, we've seen the, the public opinion do a 180 after we go through the process. And so the question is, what do you do out at Cairo Junction? And you were asking earlier about the numbers. Here's what the numbers show. In the last 10 years, 31 crashes. That is an astronomical number of crashes for an uncontrolled intersection in this part of the state with the amount of traffic going through there. That's more than three crashes a year. There was a fatal crash in 2013, 16 injury crashes, 14 property damage only crashes. So what do you do out at Cairo Junction? Perspective. Cairo Junction probably has about the 5,000 um, average daily traffic, so about 5,000 vehicles a day going through there. Uh, East Idaho out here is pushing somewhere around 25 right now, 25,000, you know, back towards Walmart and stuff. And the freeway out here, we're somewhere between probably right around 18 right now. Um, so, so I think. Because and, and, I've been waiting to ask that question, but Paul, thank you for, for stating that. I mean, I, 
when you talk about 31 fatal crashes, that's a terrible number. But what you got to apply to it is what's the average daily load. I mean, 31 daily crashes with 5,000 cars, cars a day is a huge number. Mm -hmm. 31 fatal, 31 crashes with an average daily load of 30,000 is not. Right. Yeah. So that, you, you got I think that's a part of the equation. It has to be. That, that's the part. That's the part that sticks out for me because this is the type of crash numbers that we would typically see at an intersection in Western Oregon, where the traffic volumes are four times as great at a particular intersection, yet you're experiencing this out at Cairo Junction, which has got a quarter of the traffic volume going through it. That sends off red flags right there. So it, 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 in my belief, for what that's worth, is it's not the roundabout, it's not the signalize, it's slowing the speed down. So the only way to really successfully slow the speed down is to manipulate the traffic in a manner that's, that's different than a roundabout is it. It's not, you know, because if it's a signalized light, people think they can shoot it. And, and they're not going to slow their speed down. You're, you're right on the speed, and then there's it's one, all the speed. Yeah, there's one other key track. factor also, and that's the geometry. Right. So in, in, in an in a, a intersection like that, we're putting people at 90 degrees to each other. And so whenever there's a crash, it's all, almost always either a high-speed rear-end crash or a T-bone crash. And in a roundabout, they're almost 100% size bike type crashes, which they're still crashes, but result in nearly no serious injuries or fatals. Whereas you have a high speed rear end crash or a T-bone crash, and it nearly always results in either a serious injury or, or a fatal. But the speed is also, I mean, they're both, they both work right along with each other. Yep. Have they thought about Slowing the traffic down at that intersection, but rumble strips. So slow the traffic down because virtually that's all you're doing is slowing traffic down. No, we're changing the geometry also. Yes. We're changing the geometry where we're taking people out of T-bone crashes and putting them in the side right. configuration. There. We threw a drone up in the the sky, and you can see this is the one outside Forest Grove. This is where Omega Morgan goes through. Look at this outside truck apron and the inside truck apron. This thing's huge. All the red stuff. Is All the red stuff is mountable for trucks that huge loads to go through. This is an ODOT roundabout. This, this is how big we design them. You're going to I mean, you're going to have to have a driver that's really misbehaving going 40 miles trying to go 40 miles per hour through there. Look at look at this guy. He's slowing down to about around 20. He's going through with no problems whatsoever. He's going right through it like what it's designed to do and the proper speed. It's where they're gonna get in trouble is when they go in there too fast and too hot. And a lot more traffic. Yeah, mm -hmm. but then they should be slowing down anyways if there's more traffic in there anyways. If you talk about your aprons, how, how, how tall are they? Three inches, and they're, not, and they're not vertical curbs. They're uh, mountable curbs, so you're not gonna get any sidewall scrubbing. I'm looking at when you come into these and you get a car that tries to run you in there and forces you over on it, I've got a load of cattle on and I run that trailer up on an apron, it's going to throw them cattle in the same direction. I'm They're designed specifically with the different contrasting and I've yet to see vehicles because it's uncomfortable. It's not bad for you with your truck suspensions, but it's bad for a passenger vehicle to go over those. They're, they're going to feel it much more than you're going to feel it and I've yet to see these cars try to cut, cut through here. Yeah, on those trying right to and trying to cut you off or anything like that yeah. um, I was a skeptic of, of roundabouts for a long time until I got in areas that I had them and used them and saw how the traffic mm -hmm. moves and I I'm more of a convert now. so this isn't the end of a conversation this is the start of a conversation and so this is going to be where you know Paul's office and Sean and Ken Patterson and you know our our area and our our local people that are boots on the ground here are going to be engaging in and as we need to come in and work through an iterative process like I said we haven't the, the pro, there's a project program for what 2023 2023 is what it's programmed for right now but you know no final decisions have been made we know from a from a safety standpoint if the goal is to improve safety out there your options are very limited and a signal will not be an option to improve safety out at that intersection. It's just the numbers show that that's not the case. And 
I don't think there's a person in this room that wants to see another fatal crash or high severity crash happen at Cairo Junction. But it's one of the worst spots in this part of the state and I'm glad we have some money in the STIP to do that. I'm glad that our legislative leaders got House Bill 2017 passed and got some money in there. And so we have an opportunity here to, to make a difference. And it's going to take uh, working together on the solutions and, in, and making sure we're not leaving commercial drivers behind in the process. Thank you very much. Thank you.